Good us, uh, we've come in your name and in another Aiden's video. Welcome to yet another exciting video, in this case covering episodes 74 to 79 in Season 3 of Star Trek, the original series. This video looks at the number of episodes of Star Trek, the original series or generation to identify historical references which can be used to determine the original history of the Star Trek universe. Special thanks to the transcripts which can be found on the Chakotay site. The episode order is the production order. In order to understand the development or of the history or vision of this series, we need to study the episodes in the order they were written. While I'm uncertain of the exact writing order, the production order is about as close as I can get. When Gene Roddenberry first created Star Trek back in 1966, he had a vision which remained basically consistent over the following three years. The animated series and the early movies retained this consistency in the most part. When The Next Generation was released in 1987, Gene's vision had changed and the past needed to change in order to be consistent with this new vision. This video series will look at the original vision of Star Trek starting with the earliest source material. The Cloud Miners is the 21st episode of the third season. It was the 74th episode produced. Its star date is 5818.4 and its original air date was the 28th of February 1969. In this episode we learn Ardana is a Federation member planet, certainly alien, even if the inhabitants are humanoid. Quote, at Federation orders we're proceeding at top warp speed to the planet Ardana where the only source of Zenite exists. When we arrive at Ardana, we discover the planet has floating cities in which the people of Stratos live. Quote, Spock, Stratos, Captain, a city actually floating in the sky. Kirk, looks as tranquil as its reputation, doesn't it? On the ground of this planet uh, and in the mines, an almost different race lives and mines Zenite. I suspect that there was a single race, but some went into the clouds and the others remained on the ground and they diverged. Quote, I don't understand it. These trollogite miners were supposed to have made the delivery when we beamed it down. The episode also mentions the Federation planet Merrick 2. This is likely a member of the Federation and has a large population. It's unknown if it's human or allied, alien. As the Enterprise is probably on the Federation border, this is most likely an alien, even if humanoid, race. Quote, we received word from Merrick 2 that the plague is spreading rapidly. The key takeaways from this episode are a Alien Federation member planet called Ardana and probably another Alien Federation member planet called Merak 2. The Way to Eden is the 20th episode of the third season. It was the 75th episode produced. Its star date is 5832.3 and its original air date was the 21st of February 1969. In the episode, we get to see a space cruiser called Aurora, which I assume is a civilian craft of some description, does look rather familiar. Quote, it's definitely the stolen space cruiser, Captain, the Aurora. I read six aboard. We discover in the episode a new planet, Catulan. Catulan is a planet, or planets, in negotiation with the Federation. It's probably a non-Federation alien planet. Perhaps it does join the Federation eventually, but not at this point. Quote, the son of the Catulan ambassador is one of the six we have beamed aboard from the stolen cruiser Aurora. We have been ordered to hand him back, handle him with extreme delicacy. Because the treaty negotiations now in progress between the Federation and Catulan are at a critical phase. We also discover in this episode another planet, Tiburian. Tiburian is a Federation planet with major research capability, probably a Federation member planet, and almost certainly Human, quote, a brilliant research engineer in the field of acoustics, communication and electronics on Taburian. Once again, the key takeaways we get from this episode is we get more planets. Catulan is a non-Federation planet currently negotiating a treaty with the Federation, probably alien and on the borders of the Federation. Taburian is a Federation member planet, most likely large and human. Requiem for Methuselah is the 19th episode of the third season. It was the 76th episode produced. Its star date is 5843.7 and its original air date was the 14th of February 1969. The episode does mention Regalian fever, no doubt from one of the five inhabited Rigels identified so far. Quote, the Enterprise is in the grip of a raging epidemic. Three crewmen have died and 23 others have been struck down by Regalian fever. In this episode, we are shown another system with an inhabited planet, the system being Omega System. It's probably in Federation space and must have been surveyed sometime in the past. It is the home of Flint. 
Quote, our sensors have picked up sufficient quantities of pure Ritalian on a small planet in the Omega system. We are beaming down to secure this urgently needed material. The main protagonist in this episode is Flint. Flint is, or was, immortal, born in 3834 BC. Now that he's left Earth, he will age normally. Quote, Flint. In that region of Earth, later called Mesopotamia, in the year 3834 BC, as the millenniums are reckoned, I was Arcanian, a soldier, a bully and a fool. I fell in battle, pierced to the heart, and did not die. We get the name of another Federation planet, in this case Centauri 7. Could this be a planet in the Alpha Centauri system? Seems likely, which means it must be a human Federation member planet by now. Regardless, because Flint was there, and Flint probably followed human expansion, it certainly was a human planet, wherever it happens to be. We get the name of it, yet another Federation planet, in this case Marcus too. I'm guessing this is also a human Federation planet, as Flint was probably moving outward with the Earth colonists, and he would have followed the humans. Quote, the majority are the works of Leonardo da Vinci, Renaissance period, some of the works of Reginald Pollock, a 20th century, and even a stern from Marcus II. The planet Flint is living on is called Holbert 917G. Only Flint lives on the planet, obviously with his android. Quote, Kirk, Mr. Scott, run a computer check on Mr. Flint's and on this planet. Holbert 917G, stand by with your results. I'll contact. Yet more takeaways are yet more planets. Omega System, one inhabited planet, which Flint lives on. Centauri 7, a Federation human member planet, probably in the Alpha Centauri system. Marcus 2, a Federation human member planet, as Flint was living on it. We also discover in this episode an immortal Flint, who was born in 3834 BC. The Savage Curtain is the 22nd episode of the third season. It was the 77th episode produced. Its star date is 5906.4 and its original air date was 7th of March 1969. The Enterprise finds a molten planet which seems to have the um, signs of a powerful civilization on it. No Federation name is provided. Quote, the surface is molten lava. The atmosphere is poisonous. The aliens conjure up, assuming from, assumably from the memories of Spock, Surak, the father of Vulcan, who was obviously a pacifist. While not contained in this episode, Memory Alpha claims Surak lived in the 4th century, which I assume is Earth century, which is sometime between 300 and 399 AD. As Vulcans lived for a long time, I can assume he was born in 300 AD and lived probably through the entire century. While this time frame of 1,966 years, or possibly less, may seem like a long time, it only represents about 19 to 20 generations for a Vulcan. A good question is, when did the Romulans leave Vulcan? I would assume it would have occurred during the period of war in order to allow all records to be lost, basically in the time of Surak, or possibly just before. If the Romulans had a primitive space drive, which took many years to arrive at Romulus, they could have arrived there in, let's say, 400 AD, giving them about 1,600 years to colonize and populate their primary planet, and then start expanding into space, meeting the Terran expansion, going in the opposite direction, which obviously resulted in war. While a stretch, I have to assume the lifespan of the Romulans must be less than the Vulcans. Perhaps the long travel in radiation field space affected this, as to populate Romulus in 1,600 years would take a much shorter lifespan. Unless, of course, Romulan women act as, as baby machines, which I seriously doubt. In the episode, we discover the molten world is called Excalibur and is inhabited by a powerful race of rock creatures. Quote, Captain, our world is called Excalibur. In this episode, we are introduced to Colonel Green, who led a genocide of war early in the 21st century on Earth. He was a leader of an Earth country and most likely fought a minor war against another neighbouring Earth country sometime in the early 21st century or any time between 2000 and 2033. For no specific reason, I'm using a date of 2000, but it could certainly be later. We learn of yet another planet, in this case a Tiburian. It was probably an alien non-Federation planet. Zora was an evil woman who conducted experiments on the inhabitants of this planet. I have no idea of when this occurred or any of the other supplementary detail. 
Quote, Zora, who was experimenting with the body chemistry of subject tribes on Tiburon. Another of the most evil people that um, the aliens managed to conjure up was Cunless the Unforgettable. This, the Klingon founding father was this character, Cunless the Unforgettable, which set the pattern for Klingon tyrannies. While not contained in the episode, Memory Alpha claims he first united the Klingons in the 9th century, which I assume is the 9th century, which is sometime between 800 and 899 AD. While an interesting theory, the only issue is Kallus uniform, which resembles a modern Klingon uniform. The other issue is the 9th century is more than 1400 years ago. It would be like saying that Justinian's attempt to reunify the Roman Empire set the pattern of all Western civilization, which of course is really quite ludicrous. As the Klingons were, you know, a stand-in for the Soviets, Carlos is closer to a Lenin, Stalin or Mao character who set the pattern of their own respective totalitarian civilizations and unified their people and started expanding out. A good analogy would be if Trotsky was leader of the USSR and managed to conquer the world as he always wanted to do. The Klingons would have had to expand into space about the same time as the Romulans and Terrans. So linking him to Lenin in 1919 or 20 could work. This gives him 80 years to unify his world and then his successor would sally out to create the Klingon Empire and then to eventually meet the Romulans and then the Terrans or Federation. Quote, Carlos the Unforgettable, the Klingon who set the pattern for his planet's tyrannies. Key takeaway from this episode is yet more planets. Excalibur and its inhabited by a powerful race of rock creatures, alien and not Federation, Tiburion, an alien non-Federation planet. Some characters from history are disclosed. The founding father of Vulcan logic, Surak, who seemed also to be a pacifist, uh, which does not describe Vulcan, but perhaps his angle was that truly logical creatures do not engage in violence. The founding father of Klingons, Kalis the Unforgettable, who probably first established the aggressive communist style of government Klingon used. Colonel Green, who we will assume was the leader of a minor country on Earth and who engaged in a genocidal war with another minor country on Earth, which was short and bloody. All Our Yesterdays is the 21st episode of the third season. It was the 78th episode produced. Its star date is 5943.7 and its original air date was the 14th of March, 1969. This episode, in this episode, we discover yet another star system which will go Nova. In this case, a Beta Noble. It's a really unstable galaxy out there. The system has one inhabited system or planet. Sarapion, it was probably an alien non-Federation planet, which the Federation kind of knew about, possibly when they first investigated the star. Quote, we have calculated that Beta Neobel will go Nova in approximately three and a half hours. Its only satellite, Sarapidion, is a Class M planet, which as at last report was inhabited by a civilized humanoid civilization or species. During this episode, Spock gets sent back 5,000 years to before his people were logical and he begins to revert to his pre-logical Vulcan Spock. As the Vulcans became logical in 300 AD, which is less than 2,000 years ago, this is logical. Quote, All right, it must be the Serapian Ice Age, possibly 5,000 years ago. The key takeaways from this episode are the Beta Niob system will be going Nova, Sarapion in that system will be destroyed. It's a alien, non-Federation planet. The Vulcans 5,000 years ago were very aggressive and emotional. Turnabout Intruder is the 24th episode of the third season. It was the 79th episode produced. Its star date is 5928.5 and its original air date was the 3rd of June 1969. This episode discloses yet another Federation research facility exploring a long-dead civilization. The planet is called Camus II. When it collapsed is not mentioned, neither the reason why. There is a functioning machine and the ruins don't look that old, so perhaps something may have killed the civilization slowly, with the last inhabitants dying only a few hundred years prior. Perhaps this machine was critical in keeping the survivors alive. My wild guess is this civilization may have collapsed, let's say, 300 years ago, about 1966. This could be totally wrong, and we have many examples of functioning machines from dead civilizations which are older, but it's the line in the sand or the the line in sand that I'm going to be drawing in this particular uh, case. Quote, the Enterprise has received a distress call from a group of scientists on Camus 2 
who are exploring the ruins of a dead civilization. Benyaka Colony must be a reasonably developed colony, but not sufficient to have advanced medical facilities. It's a Federation colony, so it's a colon so if it's a colony, it's almost certainly human. Quote, Kirk, Mr. Chekhov, plot course for the uh, Benedict colony. Chekhov, direct course to Benedict, 373 Mark 8. The Enterprise was going to meet another starship at Beta Arguria. This could be uninhabited, but this is unlikely. This is most likely another minor colony, or perhaps a military base, or some form of logistic planet. I'll go with the, um, you know, minor Federation human colony angle. Quote, Captain, we will delay our work at Tabita Aguria. It means reversing course. Kirk, yes, it can't be helped. We must take Dr. Lester to a place where she can be treated. We discover yet another starbase, in this case Starbase 2. This is a new starbase which we've never encountered before. Spock, may I point out that Starbase 2 is on the direct route to our destination. Kirk, how long to Starbase 2? Chekhov, 72 hours, Captain. The Potemkin is a constitutional uh, class starship which we last saw in Season 2, Episode 24, The Ultimate Computer. Quote, Spock, sir, I believe Starfleet will have to be notified that our rendezvous with this starship Potemkin will not place as not take place as scheduled. In this episode, uh, we have the Tholian Sector mention. The events of the Tholian web occurred in the Tholian Sector. Quote, Janice, Spock, when I was caught in the interspace of the Tholian Sector, you risked your life and the Enterprise to get me back. We also get another mention of the Vians. Um, the Vians, which the Enterprise met in the Minara star system, um, now, in this particular case, they call them Vians of Minara, but that's not really where they came from. Anyway, quote, When the Vians of Minara demanded that we let Bones die, we didn't permit it. The key takeaway from this episode, the very last episode of the original series, is Camus 2 is a Federation research station exploring a dead alien civilization. Benekia Colony, a Federation human colony, reasonably would develop, but not large enough to have medical facilities better than the Starship. Beta Orguinia, unknown but probably a Federation colony, possibly a small one at that. Starbase 2, yet another starbase. We also discover the starship Pekemkin is still floating around. And so we come to another end of my video. In fact, this is the end of the Next Generation series uh, blow-by-blow breakdown of the scripts. The episode scripts can be found using the URL shown. Studying the early episode makes it obvious that many of the latter Star Trek TV series and movies and shows do not align with the original vision of the series. Alle guten Dingen, kommen zu einem Ende.